All right, I'm going to call a special meeting back to order. A recording and or broadcast of this meeting is being made at the direction of the board, and the recording and or broadcast may capture images and sounds of those attending the meeting. Uh, since we are once again virtual, I will quickly call the roll. Uh, Mr. K? Here. Mr. Talio? Here. Ms. Spicer? Here. Mr. Ivanovich? Here. I am here. All board members are present. We'll move on to D2 agenda approval. I'd like Anyone to like move to the agenda as, uh, as presented. Second. Motion to approve by Vladimir, second by Shali. We call the roll. Shali? Yes. Steve? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Vladimir? Yes. I vote yes. Motion passes 5 0. Mm. No action was taken in closed session, so we will move on to the consent calendar. Um, I'd like to move that we approve its consent calendar as uh, presented. Second. Motion to approve consent items E1 and E2 from Vladimir, seconded by Shally. We'll once again call the roll. Shally? Yes. Vladimir? Yes. Steve? Yes. Jessica? Yes. I vote yes. Motion passes 5 nothing. Moving on to item F1, reopening for the 2020-21 school year. Staff will present the health and safety portions of the draft 2020-21 reopening plan. These portions of the plan adhere to the requirements set forth by the California Department of Public Health and Santa Clara County Public Health Department. Regarding the safe operation of schools, it is essential we have these plans in place to maximize the safe return to school campuses for both students and staff. Mr. Baer. Yes, good evening. Um, good to see you all again. Wanted to, we're going to walk you through two portions today. Um, we've broken this up into a, a health and safety portion as well as a teaching and learning portion um, that Sandra will go through and Jennifer actually uh, a little bit later. Um, there are quite a number of people involved in assembling um, uh, the, the structures and the protocols and the processes and um, kind of triangulating requirements from various government agencies to lead us to uh, a safe reopening for the 2021 school year, um, which is just about three weeks away. So I um, uh, wanna, wanna take you tonight through the health and safety portion. This will be the, the the newest information to you. A lot of this is similar to what was, was shared at the town hall last week, um, but I think important to bring again. And also attached to this agenda is the um, draft of the school reopening plan, which we will look for your consideration and approval this evening. So uh, next slide. Um, and before I get too far into it, just want to let you know that there are going to be a few people sharing information tonight. Um, I will certainly run through some information. Monica uh, Sidher and Mary Fitzgerald, our two LASD nurses, are here as well, who will take you through some of the portions of the, the finer points of the health and safety uh, requirements. Uh, Randy Kenyon is here also, and he'll walk through the, some of the facilities and operations portions. As I had said earlier, Sandro will take us through the teaching and learning portion, as well as Jennifer Kiker, a special education director, uh, will speak specifically to special education. And I think that's everyone who's going to speak. Yes. So uh, with that, I'll start with uh, on the screen are four documents, uh, the covers of four documents, uh, which are really the guiding documents for us in planning for a safe reopening of school in, the, um, in August of, of 2020. Um, so uh, starting on the outsides, uh, on the far left is the, the Santa Clara County Public Health document. On the far right is the State of California Public Health Department document. Um, and then on the interior, there's a document on the left from Santa Clara County Office of Education. And on the right, the third document over is from the California Department of Public Education. So California Department of Public Education. So um, 
these have really been the, the guiding documents to steer us to a safe reopening. It has uh, been quite a bit of work uh, uh, reconciling them against one another to really understand uh, which of them guide our work and our safety for students and staff. Next document. Oh, I'm sorry, next slide. Uh, as you're aware, uh, there were new California Department of Public Health do, uh, guidance given on Friday the 17th. Um, this was about a week and a half ago. Uh, Governor Newsom uh, at a press conference shared this new guidance from uh, CDPH and it, it, um, it really reorganized some of what we have what we had to do, so it, it, it caused us to go back to the drawing board in, in a number of places. Um, but uh, really didn't change our path drastically since back on July 6th, uh, you as a board approved a continuum of learning that really contemplated these changes. It just, uh, the changes really caused us to focus initially in, the, in a different place. So uh, first, monitoring list. Uh, the, the watch list in the state of California has changed names. It's now the monitoring list. Uh, if you go to the California Department of Public Health website, you can see all the Santa Clara, all of the California counties listed, and they are measured against uh, five indicators. And if any of those indicators are tripped, a county lands on the monitoring list. Currently, Santa Clara County is um, on the monitoring list. We have gone on and off two or three times since uh, Friday the 17th, uh, but currently we're on for a uh, number of cases um, per 100,000. We're above the 100 cases per 1,000 threshold, as well as the increase in hospitalization that has occurred over the last three days. That number uh, has gone up over 10% now. So we're, Santa Clara County is on the monitoring list for, for two of the metrics. Um, in order for schools to reopen, this cannot happen until a county is off the monitoring list for 14 days and on the 15th day, uh, schools can reopen at that point. Uh, each time a county lands back on the monitoring list, that 14 day clock resets. So currently our clock in Santa Clara County is not running because we have not yet been off that uh, monitoring list. Uh, so with this in mind, uh, we made the uh, decision back on the 17th of July to uh, begin our school year in a distance learning format to begin online. Um, and that was communicated out to all of our families and all of our staff as well. Uh, a couple of the key changes from those uh, California Department of Public Health guidelines. Um, one is that facial coverings are going to be required for students in grade three and above. Um, so we have changed all of our documentation to require that. Uh, it also uh, suggests regular testing for all staff. So our um, health services department is currently working with El Camino Hospital to line up that testing for uh, all LASD staff and we're working out the details of that right now. Um, additionally, the Department of Public Health guidelines uh, allowed for a waiver um, for elementary school sites within a district. In our case, that would be K TK6 sites. Um, the county has followed up with uh, uh, guidelines for applying for that waiver. Uh, so we are currently looking into that. Uh, county Department of Public Health is uh, still working on its um, its guidelines for that waiver, so it's not moving forward just yet, but we are uh, talking to Santa Clara County Public Health Department because that is where we need to go first in pursuit of any sort of waiver. 
So stay tuned on that. We are, uh, we are working on that. Uh, as we look at a waiver, we really look at um, beginning, and I'll talk about this more at the end, but as we talk about a, um, a waiver, we really look at our students who are identified in uh, the, plan, the teaching and learning plan that was adopted, um, the, the students that are most disadvantaged uh, in a distance learning situation. We think of special day class students, we think of beginning English learners, uh, we think of um, um, our, our low socioeconomic uh, status students who are really disproportionately impacted. Uh, so that is where we would look for the waiver to begin. Um, and as we think about coming back, bringing children back, uh, either in the, uh, when we're off the watch list or as we pursue a waiver, we'd really wanna look at doing that in a, a thoughtful um, uh, kind of stepped manner uh, in order to ensure safety of both the students and, and our staff because we really can't have one happening without the other. Uh, so more, more about that to follow. So Marcy, next slide. So uh, as we look at uh, this move from um, online to safe in-person learning, uh, I said earlier that the board really contemplated this in the adoption of the plan and this idea of a continuum. We are now um, really looking to prepare to reopen when it's safe and allowable um, and understanding how, as I said earlier, how we can do that in a thoughtful way to ensure safety of all. Um, we are building classes right now and we'll talk a little more about that, but we're building classes for both, for both approaches, for both the blended, for the families who eventually wanna be here in person and the 100% virtual for the families who have chosen to be in a virtual setting because of uh, particular concerns they have about their health or their children's health. Uh, it's important that we build out both of these approaches um, because when we do get the green light to begin bringing children back, we wanna make sure that we are set up to do that. And so setting up now, planning for staffing now in each of these models is, uh, is critical. And I already talked about this prioritization of, of students with the highest need. So next slide. Um, so planning for both of these will really, both 100% uh, virtual and the blended when we can come back safely uh, is really critical because if we are planned for both of those and we have set up uh, structures for both of those, when that green light is given, we are gonna be able to minimi minimize the disruption. Um, and a lot of work is going to have been done in building community, building relationships uh, within classes, be them virtual or blended, and really addressing our students' uh, social emotional wellness. So we wanna make sure there's that smooth transition to in-person learning uh, when that time comes. So. Great deal of work going, going on right now. Uh, we've uh, received uh, the vast majority of uh, parent surveys uh, for them to indicate which, which, uh, which model uh, they choose. And as I said, staffing is, is underway now to look at that. Next slide. Um, and what, what, the, what the governor's uh, uh, press conference and the California Department of Public Health's uh, guidance document has really uh, emphasized is this, and, and really brought to light for us as well, is this idea of needing to balance the in-person learning and the want to get kids back. We know we're at our very best when children are in front of us and we're teaching with a uh, strong, caring teacher in front of our children um, and balancing that with ensuring that we do it in a safe manner for both students and for staff uh, because we would hate to do a full uh, uh, restart when we don't have all of our 
uh, safety mitigations in place, uh, which would throw us backwards into a virtual situation uh, and would rather do it in a situation where we do it in a thoughtful, um, uh, systematic way of bringing back kids. So next slide. So with that, I will um, introduce Monica Sidher, who is one of our outstanding uh, district nurses to talk to us a bit about um, health and safety provisions. Monica, can you take the first one too? All right, so you can unmute yourself. Great, thank you, Jeff. So uh, we've basically taken all of the key um, important health uh, and safety measures, all of them really, uh, and sort of broken them down into how we're going to um, provide this and support our teachers and students in keeping them healthy and safe. Um, so screening is part of that. That means having everybody screened before arriving on site. That goes for both staff and students having face coverings for everybody, physical distancing, hand hygiene, testing and reporting, as Jeff mentioned, um, <clears throat> having uh, testing, regular testing available for all of our staff, as well as following Santa Clara County public health guidelines for reporting for anyone that's positive, as well as isolating and quarantining. Uh, Randy will speak a bit about the cleaning and disinfecting protocols, and then the communication with our parent community, our staff community, um, and as well as our students in the classrooms. Next slide. So this slide is uh, from the public health department, essentially guiding the organizing principle for um, how we want to prevent transmission based on age groups. So um, looking at the fact that older children from what studies show um, are transmitting the virus very similar to adults. Um, and so we want to make sure that we are uh, establishing distancing protocols, so adhering to those requirements as well as required mask wearing. And then for our, our younger students or our TK through second grade students, um, those students um, really focusing on maintaining the stable cohorts and ensuring that they are also wearing face masks to the greatest extent possible following distancing protocols to the greatest extent possible, but really keeping them with their stable uh, cohorts in the classroom. Next slide. So the screening process here, uh, the requirement is that everybody who comes onto campus must be screened for symptoms. Um, and this also does include a temperature check. Um, Anybody who presents with symptoms that are listed on the Santa Clara County uh, guideline must remain home uh, and then follow up with their physician uh, and get tested if that's what's required. And if they are not to be tested, then they need to provide a physician's note for why testing is not needed and what the alternate explanation is for the symptoms that are presented that are COVID-like symptoms. Uh, students will be the same process, so we will be asking parents and guardians to screen their children before sending them to school. Uh, our IT department is working on an app um, to have accessible to parents as well as staff where they can easily enter this information and that information will be communicated to the school site uh, where follow-up can be done um, as well as checking with the parents who aren't able um, and staff who aren't able to complete that um, that app and uh, screening process so that we can check in with them and make sure that that's being followed up on and done. Next slide. So face coverings, uh, this is uh, broken down by uh, everybody and then our lower, our lower elementary students, so TK through second and then third grade and up. So for everybody, everybody must wear a face covering whenever they're entering campus, when they're leaving campus, if they're stepping outside of their classroom. Uh, the exceptions to that are if they are eating or drinking um, or involved in physical activity. Uh, students third grade and up, so third through eighth grade, must wear their face coverings in addition to coming on campus, leaving campus outside their classroom. They must also wear their face coverings inside of their classrooms, um, so within their uh, classroom setting. 
And then TK through second grade, um, although there's not a requirement, uh, we are, again, to the greatest extent possible, um, asking that students do wear their face coverings even within, within their classrooms. Uh, the, the focus here and the understanding as well is that these students being the age that they are will need a little bit more support with that and some guidance. So uh, we don't want it to be um, a punitive uh, sort of approach to the mask wearing. We want to be able to guide them and teach them and show them and allow for breaks in an appropriate setting if, if some students need it and working with individual students and families um, as the need arises. Next slide. Physical distancing. So uh, we have established teams on each of our school sites that are walking through these logistical pieces. So making sure that we um, can, you know, move furniture, move desks, so that there there is the distancing um, ability within a classroom setting, as well as lunch and break, um, arrival and dismissal. So looking at staggering schedules so that we don't have mixing of cohorts during these times, as well as um, recess times and lunch times. Uh, there won't be any large gatherings uh, until further notice. So things like field trips, assemblies, play practices, um, just anything that will have uh, large groups of people together and potential mixing of different cohorts, um, as well as campus visitor uh, minimization. So we are really asking only necessary individuals to come onto campus. If a parent needs to come onto campus, um, trying to have it be one one person from the household versus everybody um, and really uh, really making it about people who need to be there um, and mask use for everybody who enters campus. Next slide. Uh, so hand hygiene. This has been important for before COVID and will be just as important after COVID as well. So um, really great emphasis on hand hygiene for staff as well as families. We are asking teachers to incorporate a hand hygiene protocol into their instruction time. So, um, you know, focusing that into their schedule every day, things like when everybody arrives on campus, the first thing they do when they come into the classroom is wash their hands. They wash their hands when they leave classroom to go to recess, when they come back from recess, before lunch, after lunch after they go to the bathroom. Um, if they are touching anything that other students may be touching in the classroom, hand washing or hand sanitizing. So really focusing on the frequency of that, um, as well as uh, reviewing what, what proper hand hygiene is. Um, adequate supplies, we've ordered lots of hand sanitizer. Uh, our maintenance and operations group has gone through classrooms and made sure that the sinks are functional. We've ordered extra hand washing stations to put into the wings of certain school sites where classrooms don't have sinks available to them. Um, paper towels as well, just ensuring that we have all those supplies. We've also ordered uh, portable hand washing, um, sorry, portable hand sanitizer stations um, that we can put outside of classrooms as well as the play areas outside of the front office. Um, so that those are reminders, including signage. Lots of signage has been ordered as well to put up, reminding people to wash their hands. Uh, we're asking for everybody to uh, minimize the sharing of supplies. So this could be everything from electronics to making sure that students have their own pencils and their own crayons and, and supplies available to them at their desks. If they do need to share supplies, again, really going back to that basic hand washing and sanitizing and focusing in on that. Um, and then asking our staff to, to help with minimization of contact with high touch services. So things like propping open the classroom doors if feasible uh, so that teachers, other staff members or other students are not pushing the doors open and closed when they're coming in and out of the classroom. Uh, if they have an established hand washing routine that they, the teacher can be the one to actually turn the faucet on and then students come in and start washing their hands. So think little things like that that will help um, multiple people touching the same thing. Next Monica, slide. Monica, yeah. at this moment, it might be a good idea just uh, attached to the agenda tonight is the uh, 10 things you can do at home before school starts document. Do you just want to yeah. talk just a moment about what that is? And to anyone watching, you can find it attached to the agenda. Yeah, so uh, we've worked on creating a 10 things to do before returning to school sort of information sheet for families. 
Um, and that walks through uh, really supporting families and giving them resources to review a lot of these things at home with their children before schools are actually open in person. So hand washing is on there. The use of face covers is on there. How do you take care? How do you wash a face cover? How do you make a face cover? Um, we talk about physical distancing on the flyer, as well as other things for families to be doing now before uh, in-person classes can resume. So things like contacting their physician if they have concerns about their child returning to school, getting their immunizations up to date, um, having a water bottle available. So we're not gonna have drinking fountains for students. We're gonna use the drinking fountains in the classroom as a water bottle refiller. So having families sort of thinking ahead about these things. Um, and then we also have links on there for CDC and Santa Clara Public Health Department so that families have uh, resources available and know where to look for information that's reliable. Next slide. So testing and reporting. So we are working with El Camino Hospital District to create a regular testing routine on a monthly basis for all of our staff. Uh, we are uh, requiring, and this is um, from the public health department, the requirement to notify immediately supervisor or the school if you, an individual has tested positive, is in close contact with anybody who's tested positive. Uh, and a close contact is defined as anybody who is within six feet of you for 15 minutes or more. Um, based on those reports to the school, uh, myself, Mary, um, and any one of our other nurses on site will contact the public health department uh, and walk through what is required for that individual in terms of how long they need to isolate, quarantine, and what the steps are to come back onto campus. Um, so like I mentioned, everybody will be required to be tested if they're in close contact with someone who's tested positive uh, or provide a doctor's note. So it is one or the other. Um, and they do need to meet all the requirements before they come back. Next slide. So once again, anybody who, ha who is a confirmed COVID-19 positive case, uh, we will notify the county public health department immediately and uh, right away we'll go into a contact tracing mode. So it is set up a little bit differently based on an elementary site versus a junior high site. Um, so the focus with elementary site is really about quarantine. If there's a positive case within a classroom cohort, we are to quarantine the entire classroom uh, for 14 days. And if there is a positive case at a junior high level, um, the focus is more about who has been within that six foot um, or whatever that number is as defined by public health. Uh, that Those individuals will need to quarantine uh, and isolate based on um, the requirements at that time. Next slide. So I'll and pick it up from here. Uh, Monica mentioned a number of the uh, personal protective equipment, the PPE. We have um, almost all of that in stock and all the cleaning supplies we need for, uh, for several months, not just for the start of school. Um, we, are, in terms of cleaning supplies, uh, we're also training our custodians on um, the use of various disinfectants. And we have, um, we have the custodians doing high touch surfaces on a daily basis at the end of the day in each classroom. Um, and that's kind of a hand application, a manual application of disinfectant that you're probably very familiar with at home or at your office. Uh, in addition, we have a, a mister or fogging machine for each school. And that follows up the high touch areas with basically a fogging of the entire, that blankets the entire classroom um, with disinfectant. So you get all the porous surfaces besides the high touch areas. Um, and we're very concerned about the air quality. So obviously, as much as we can have outdoor classes or outdoor activities for the kids, we know we can't do that all the time. Um, so we want to have windows and doors open as much as possible to bring in fresh air. 
So we're looking at making sure all of those windows and all the classrooms are operable. Um, making sure that we have our HVAC units operating correctly so that we're bringing in fresh air rather than recirculating stale air. So that's a big emphasis that we are uh, working on right now. And we're increasing the filter replacements on the HVAC units from semi-annually to once a month uh, to make sure we get all the part, as much filtration as possible. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview on the cleaning and disinfecting side. Oh, I just do want to mention that there are some areas, as noted on the slide, that we plan to disinfect at least twice daily, depending on, because they're high, high use areas like outdoor lunch tables in the restrooms. And we are adding signage around the campuses so kids will know where to stand, for example, outside of a restroom, how far apart, and all that kind of information uh, we'll have clearly identified on all the sites. So I'm going to turn it back to whoever's doing the next slide. All right, I got that, Randy. Thank you. And thanks to Monica as well. Um, communication is, is the final area, and we will continue with uh, regular community updates uh, through email, and that's either uh, coming from me or coming from uh, Brian as board president. Uh, have appreciated the patience as we, as we assemble this uh, over the past couple of months, um, and have also been required to flex as public health guidelines have changed along the way as well. Um, but we will continue to keep you updated about any types of changes um, that happen. Uh, also on the lesdschools.org website, there is a school reopening webpage that has a um, very large number of FAQs that are growing um, constantly as we get questions from, from parents and staff as well as uh, all of the documents you've uh, seen here tonight, including this one will be, uh, will be up there. So next slide. So out of the reopening plan, these are the eight areas uh, we thought were important to highlight. Um, they proved very useful during the town hall as well, um, just to, to update uh, staff and, and parents about the work that has been done with regard to, to health and safety. Um, so next slide. One of the other areas is um, looking at when, it, when we are able to bring students back, what is that going to look like? Um, and this is an example, right? And bring it forward to you as a, as a starting point, right? But this is the, uh, the um, how I would recommend we think of bringing students back on campus, right? We're starting in phase A right now with 100% distance learning, looking to uh, move to phase B um, as soon as we can actually through the waiver process of um, looking at our special populations and how can we get them back on campus uh, for periods of time to provide that in-person uh, in instruction. And then rolling through grade level pairs essentially, right? Looking at TK and K, looking at grades one and two, three and four, the I five and six, seven and eight. The idea here is um, bringing cohorts of kids back, ensuring that we can bring those children back safely, get them to uh, both staff, parents and students to comply with the required um, protocols at campuses, uh, making sure that we don't have uh, outbreaks in any way um, before bringing the next group back. So if you think of this as a, a sort of model, if we roll to the next slide and actually go back, go back one, Marcy, sorry. This one does not have, um, because we're not there yet, this one doesn't have a starting date, right? Nor does it have a uh, a time span between phases, right? We think that time span is probably a minimum of two weeks um, as we look, as we evaluate the safe introduction of yet another set of uh, students on each campus. So now Marcy, thanks. Go forward to the next slide. Um, and when we think of what might those metrics be that allow us to look to 
go to the, the next phase, uh, working closely with Santa Clara County Public Health Department will be a big part of that, right? Making sure that we have uh, the correct evaluation going on and we're working with our guidance. But we think about things like uh, our ability, as I said, to comply with health safeguards. That has to do with, with face coverings and the wearing of face coverings, hand washing and physical distancing. Uh, are we, um, are we uh, uh, com complying with the daily symptom check, right? Or what's the percentage of that? We are ac absolutely aiming for 100% compliance with that. And that's one of those things we have to think about that over time, it's, it's, um, it's going to get old, right? And it's going to get the novelty is going to wear off um, and we have to stay vigilant with that if we're going to uh, continue to operate school campuses that are safe. Uh, we look at drop off, pick up, recess and lunch times. Those are the areas that the principals and the uh, operation teams at, at school sites are spending a great deal of time on because those are gonna be those are gonna be some of the critical times on campus where we have just more people showing up and it's going to um, have the potential of being a bit chaotic and when the uh, protocols might fall by the wayside if we are not vigilant. So making sure that we can, we can comply with those during those key times, especially as we add more children to the mix uh, across phases. We'll be looking at consistent attendance by teachers and students, um, making sure that our health conditions within the district are stable, um, making sure that we don't have any clusters of transmissions um, beyond uh, one-offs of people getting, getting sick, and then also looking at our local data. And again, this is where working with the Santa Clara County Public Health Department will be critical in looking at health conditions uh, at the time we are looking to uh, introduce more students to the campus. We'll always wanna have that 100% virtual option for our families this year. We're committed to that. And then, um, you know, really staying uh, poised should we have to move back on that continuum to 100% uh, virtual for all, 100% online learning for all because of some requirement by county or state health. So um, the next slide, and Brian, I'm going to kind of tee up here. We the, these are some steps at this meeting. I'd really like the board to uh, think about and consider and have a discussion on. But I also think it, the context of this is important. So pushing to Sandra's um, slides, I think would make sense before we have that board conversation. But I'll leave that to you. Yeah, I think that makes the most sense. So Marcy, can you bring up that next set? Thank you, Marcy. Voila, so here we are teaching and learning. Uh, at our last board meeting, I believe, we just, uh, focused a little bit more on the blended option for families, um, for students. So tonight I wanted to make sure you had the full picture and had an opportunity to really dive deeply into what that virtual option looks like. And knowing that all of our students are going to start in an online format is important. So next slide, please. Um, we really wanted to start with this idea that regardless of format, there are some really important pieces that make our educational experience terrific for students in LASD. These are those things, the rich instruction and good work, the personalization that we're able to provide for our students, um, the great relationship, safety and belonging that we know are so critical for everyone to be learners and obviously those um, really important opportunities where we make meaning together. And this is that one is kind of the one that uh, the how changes depending on the model of the program. So next slide. 
Um, of course, we do not want the fall term to feel like the spring term. We don't want that for our teachers. We don't want that for our families. So we've learned a lot from uh, the great parts that happened in the spring, as well as the pain points a little bit from what happened in the spring to develop a program um, uh, that will uh, better engage kids in virtual learning. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> One extra slide. Um, so as you know, virtual learning is comprised of these two pieces, both asynchronous and synchronous. Synchronous happens in real time. Asynchronous is uh, not in real time. Next push, please. And when we think about asynchronous in this virtual model, you know and you've heard and you've seen some examples of learning plans that will be kind of the basis of our asynchronous experience for students. Uh, it includes that rich instruction, those high quality videos, uh, which may or may not be their classroom teacher, but certainly either another expert teacher in Los Altos School District or one of our great partner teachers as well. And those learning plans also offer some meaningful work for students to engage in independently or with the support of their caregiver, parent, or what have you. Um, next little bump there. On the synchronous side, this is where the magic happens. So this is where the actual uh, teaching and making meaning together happens. So through Google Meets in a virtual world, um, students are engaged in those variety of activities, both in whole class and perhaps half a class or in small group to really build upon the work that they're doing independently in those learning plans. Next slide. Um, so you do know that the learning plan is really the basis of that independent learning. Every student will have a learning plan for each of their subject areas and they will be delivered to families and students through Google Classroom. Next slide. Uh, and if you remember back to the learning plan, just this idea, this navigation for families and students that we have a similar wayfinding or similar navigation across learning plans to make it easier both for families and to help our less independent students navigate through that system. So this is one of those slides and learning plans that allows us to uh, communicate what is most important about a learning plan. Next slide. And so in addition to the learning plan, students will have a, a weekly schedule from their teachers. What are those expectations of what lessons do I need you to complete by when with due dates and pacing and what have you. Um, and in addition to that, they will have a weekly meet schedule for each of their classes um, or courses, depending on the age level or subject areas, um, so that there's some consistency. I know we've heard loud and clear from our, our parents as well that having a, a routine will be helpful so that there is some consistency in addition to what my regular classroom teacher is offering for my weekly meet schedule, um, along with our special classes as well. Next slide. Um, so if you look at this slide, again, it's kind of reminding us that that comprehensive learning plan is the anchor and it on the bottom provides that independent learning, but it's, it's that synchronous time, that teaching and engaging as a uh, live, either virtual or in person. Uh, those academic conversations, the small group work, that's where our social and emotional learning will come in. That's where our teachers are able to assess students both formally and informally. Um, to see how well students are progressing in their learning. Next slide. And um, I would say the, the biggest difference in the area that we really want to focus some attention on in the fall is to um, be able to provide a stronger Google Meets, live Meets with our students. We know it varied wildly across schools and across grade levels. Um, but we really want our teachers thinking about leveraging their time for live um, instruction really with some intention. So if you think about an hour long or 50 minutes at the, at the junior high school for a particular class or subject, 
starting with that whole class for a portion of that time, 20 minutes. This is where I might be doing a live demonstration. We're probably going to do a connector at the beginning and really make sure that we're all checking in with each other. Um, this might be an opportunity for me to review what students had done independently or to front load what's coming for the day in learning. From there, I'm going to excuse half of my kids go off and get going on your independent learning plan. And with that half of my class, now I'm going to get in a little bit deeper. This is where we're going to have the conversations and we're going to talk about strategies and what was most effective. I might be doing some informal or formal assessment here. I might be having kids showing their student work. We might be examining that and discussing why did you do this and so and so did this and which one might make more sense. From there, again, after a period of time, I'm going to get down to my smallest group of learners. Um, and this could be a group of learners who showed perhaps some confusion or some need for additional reteaching during either my whole or half class. It could be a group of learners where um, I see that they have a need for extension, that they're grasping the concept very quickly. These could be my English learners, um, but it, it gives teachers that framework for whole class, half class, small group for each of their Google Meets. And we would hope that the small group and the half class are rotating fairly frequently. So throughout the course of a week, each student engages in some of those um, different types of live instructional experiences. Next slide, please. So here's just a variety of things that could happen doing a, group, a Google Meet. This is not an exhaustive list, but just to get an idea that um, when you think about that wheel and what we know every student needs uh, to have a good educational experience, a lot of this is really going to happen during those live Google Meet times. Next slide. Uh, we don't want to forget our specials um, from our electives at the junior high to our computer science. I forgot to put STEM up there and made a mental note, but it didn't quite happen. But to all of our great specials that we um, are so appreciative of and proud of in our district, they too will be functioning through some learning plans and live um, meets with students. Next slide. And Jennifer, I'm going to ask you to chat a little bit about special education. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we have heard loud and clear from our families, especially our more involved um, families and more involved students, that they are very much interested in bringing their students back to campus. With their recent change, we kind of had to pivot very quickly back to um, virtual learning um, for all of our groups. And we know that this causes a lot of anxiety and angst for a lot of our family members. And so as um, the superintendent said, we're really still exploring different options. But in the meantime, we need to be planning for the next couple of weeks. So um, we have sent a letter to update our families and our staff members what the beginning few weeks most likely will look like. Um, our resource specialist program in elementary will be supporting students both in accessing their general education um, curriculum through Google Meets through making sure their accommodations um, and, and any adjustments are needed so that they can access that. They'll also have direct sessions with their caseload and the instructional assistants um, will be supporting both in the class in the gen ed setting and then also in individual sessions to make sure that their IEP goals are are worked upon. Um, for our special day classes and our junior high SAI classes, specialized academic instruction classes, again they're going to be supporting students accessing their general education classes um, and then also they will have their own Google Classroom, although that is their, they'll be doing the direct teaching following a lot what Sandra had talked about as far as having diversified um, Google um, instruction through Google Classroom. It will be a lot more individualized per the needs of the students, but um, we'll be working on, on that. And the instructional assistance assigned to that will also be supporting both in the gen ed um, arena and in the special day classes and through individual meets. Next slide. Um, all of our services, um, we really want, we've been talking all summer long about how to reduce the risk um, for our staff members and um, talking countywide as well as what, what one of the things we're doing is just to try to limit the amount of adult personnel in a campus. And so uh, most of our services will be provided remotely um, for the, at least until the risk of additional um, uh, adults on campus uh, 
changes. So for now, we're planning on having all of our designated instructional services, speech therapy, occupational therapy, vision, deaf of hard of hearing, all of those types of services done virtually. Um, we do hope to have, and we plan, on, it'll be very different than it was from March to June, where we were just you know, under emergency, like Sandra had talked about emergency teaching, same for us, it was emergency IEP services. Um, it will look a lot more like a true IEP, just instead of in person, it'll be virtual. So we hope to be able to, to do the bandwidth of the majority of our services. If you have a 30 minute speech session, we hope that you have a 30 minute virtual session. So we are expecting that. Um, that'll be delivered through teletherapy and parent coaching and model it like our synchronous and asynchronous would be teletherapy and parent coaching, right? It's kind of along those same lines. Our behavior services will happen both it could be in gen ed classrooms virtually, it could be in special day classrooms or RSP classrooms, or it could be individual. So it really depends what the goals that those behavior services are addressing, how, how they will access them, but they'll be layered throughout the entire um, week for that student. And then our counseling services will continue via teletherapy. We have a DocsyMe, which is a confidential platform and that worked really well for the majority of our, um, of our students. So we'll continue that virtually as well. And I will just say that, again, we've sent out updates. We'll continue to update the board. Um, I anticipate even more updates in the next two weeks. I don't know. And so as everything changes, I am listening and have a constant dialogue with our families. And I'm very sensitive to their needs. And we will be working along with our teaching staff as well to see what we can do to try to get um, our students the services that they do need. And that's back to you. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, constant changes seems to be the the theme this spring. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, just to get down a little bit to some brass tacks about what that virtual um, experience will look like at the start of the year and then ongoing for students who remain in virtual learning. So in K-6, you can expect um, in those core subject areas of reading, writing, and math, a weekly lesson. Um, in K-5, you can expect two science or social studies lessons over the week. Sixth grade is typically um, five lessons in science or social studies. We're still kind of working out the details for sixth grade. Um, and that's in that asynchronous realm through the learning plans along with the um, the specials that will happen asynchronously. And then in the synchronous time over the course of a week, we'll be starting each day with our morning meeting. Uh, students will have Google Meets for each of their subject areas on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, and close the day out with a closing circle. It's nice to kind of have a beginning and ending to that virtual day. And then Wednesdays really are a day for our teachers to connect with their students in the morning to make sure that everybody is set for a kind of a more increased um, independent learning time on Wednesdays. So our teachers have the time to do some um, dedicated planning and collaboration with their peers uh, throughout that time. And then students will also have some special live Google Meets during that time as well. Next slide. So a daily schedule, just a sample. Everybody loves their sample schedules. Um, but again, you can just see kind of that difference between the synchronous and asynchronous time. I know it's important to point out that for our primary students, this looks like a lot. We would expect to uh, start much kind of less and more focused with our primary students as they build that independence. Um, over the course of the of the school year. Next slide is uh, a sample for what a Wednesday might look like with one of the specials in the afternoon. Next slide. And then we move to junior high. So you can expect um, junior high students can expect five lessons assigned over the course of the week for English, science, math, and history, social studies, um, have a, a couple of PE and elective les lessons over the course of that week, and that's through their asynchronous learning plans. And then we expect them to have an advisory meeting each day, and that advisory meeting is really the um, social, emotional, executive function, welcome to junior high school uh, type meeting and connection for junior high age students, adolescents, and then the, throughout their day, they will have Google Meets for each of their subject areas. Again, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, with that Wednesday as prep and collaboration time, and then probably some time for their um, PE and or elective live meets on Wednesday as well. Next slide. I think we have a sample schedule for seventh or eighth grader. 
Next slide is a Wednesday. Next slide. This is what we do. We're really um, excited about building upon what we started in spring, but knowing that uh, we are still in a pandemic and we need that partnership with our families um, and with our teachers to make sure we can do the best we can in this virtual environment. All right, is it over me, Jeff? Yes. <laughs> um, before we go to public comments, are there any questions from board members on the presentation? I have a couple questions. Go ahead. Um, it relates to the presentation, just, just the second sections of the presentation. Um, let me go through my notes here. Um, for um, the SIPNTA checking, you said that um, there's going to be an app created uh, for that uh, for staff and children. Um, are we, um, I guess I didn't get to look at the links on the 10 things to do before returning to school. Is this, do you consider this the training um, for parents and staff uh, for making sure they really do know how to screen? Um, for uh, for COVID, um, I guess that's my first question. Monica, you want to take that? Mm -hmm. So the the app will have the questions built into it, um, and that uh, parent information sheet does list all the symptoms on what they are screening their child for, as well as uh, what temperature they are to keep their child home for. So that will all be outlined on there and then it'll be reinforced on the app with the specific questions laid out. Great, thank you. Um, as it relates to, um, this was more in the long uh, safety document, um, physical distancing and pick up and drop offs. Um, you know, we're gonna be, we're gonna open as much exit, entrances and exits as possible um, but um, who will be staffing those entrances? For example, Covington has a couple entrances. Um, we won't really have volunteers on, on campus to do traffic duty. Are we planning on it being staff or teachers? Um, and then also, again, this is another place where we need to be training staff, parents, kids, everybody on how to do, how to get on it, on, and off campus to, uh, safely. Um, so I just want to, one is a question, one is more of a, are, are we planning on training for that too? So um, short answer to that right now, Jessica, is each of the nine school sites mm -hmm. are individually working on operationalizing that document uh, okay. because it will look a little bit different at every school. Yep. So um, those are exactly the the, the details that our principals and, and staffs are working through what oh. you just described. Okay, great. Good to hear. Um, and then, you know, as I was reading about the outdoor, uh, outdoor activities, it says basically that our play structures will be open and that, uh, you know, cohorts won't be sharing them, but they'll be washed in between. Is it that we'll be having maintenance wash them in between? Is uh, parents, I guess this is similar. I, I mean, I'm now assuming your answer to your question is that's a, uh, a site level thing and that the principals are working on. Um, so and, what, tell me again, Jessica, what was the well, particular? The so, so you have the play structures um, and, yeah, so, open, and they're high touch. Um, yep. So, so we're working with with custodians and um, and their schedules, and that's going to become priority, right? They're gonna yes. there's going to be priority items that weren't priority previously, but um, now they are. Yeah, um, it's just new to us because those closed structures have been closed forever so at this point for for COVID time forever. Um, okay, and next one, um, COVID um, testing. Um, now, are we going to make sure that we at least have a resource page for where people can get, uh, I know that our staff, uh, we have a partnership with El Camino um, Health for their testing. 
um, what uh, are we going to have in place or at least uh, to direct our families for for the student testing for when it is needed so, so families you, uh, go, go ahead, ahead monica so families will have um, either to contact their primary um, physician, so their healthcare provider, as well as we'll provide them resources for Santa Clara County free testing sites, as well as El Camino Hospital. They can schedule something with them as well. So they'll be provided those resources um, from one of the uh, school staff on site. Great. I think, you know, when it comes down to it, when there is a case and when everybody has to get tested, it's it's kind of scary where, where people may not have a primary care at the time. And I want to make sure that they're ready for it um, and it's we make it less stressful for them if, if at all possible um, and then as it relates to confirmed cases so we're back in blend say we're back in blended and um, cohort a has a case it could be one a student has a case um, i understand we're going to be communicating to the whole um, school that there's been a case um, and then we'll be communicating more specifically to cohort, say the, the case was in cohort A. Um, will we be letting cohort B know um, from that class um, about it and, you know, basically making sure they're aware? I think there's slightly a, a slight chance that the, there's an exposure from the teacher, which somehow could go towards this cohort B. Um, and it's a question I've kind of heard from different parents here and there. It's a perfect yeah. opportunity for Monica to talk about secondary exposures. I love it. <laughs> so uh, the communication really, so obviously we want to respect everyone's confidentiality. That's a big piece. So the communication really is going to be guided by the public health department. They're going to have communication letters for districts to send out to staff, to parents, to the community based on what that exposure is. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have access to those documents yet. They have been working on those. Um, in regards to exposure, yes, if, if, a, if a teacher tests positive um, or if a student tests positive in that classroom, that entire classroom cohort quarantines for 14 days. And then uh, I think your question is also based on when that teacher was with the other cohort. Yeah. I think public health department would step into that and see if also the, the other cohort would then need to isolate depending on um, when they were last exposed to that teacher. So a little bit of contact tracing there in uh, conjunction with the public health department. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and this question, the next question is actually for Randy. Um, you've talked about this disinfectant mister um, a couple times. Um, can you explain what that is? Is it non-toxic? Um, is it going to be, are, are, are custodians going to be putting in one classroom at a time? Is, is it, or are there several for all classrooms? What's the deal with that? So, uh, Jessica, there's one per school. They're basically carried on a backpack wow. sprayed around. So it's easy enough for a cus night custodian to do that, cover all the classrooms. Um, it is, they will be spraying a disinfectant and like every other disinfectant, we cannot apply that when students are around. So this will be applied after school is over in the evening. And of course it needs to rest for at least five minutes before, you know, it's, and it'll rest overnight. So there's no problem bringing kids back in the morning. Great, um, thank you. Um, and on to uh, student lunches. Um, we have the situation, at least as we go start the school year, where we'll be doing probably distributing student lunches at the similar places we have been uh, since we closed and throughout the summer. Um, how are we going to be doing that when it comes to uh, blended, where half of the community is there? I guess. I guess you have the situation where some of the, the these kids actually would be in the priority groups and may uh, be there even longer for the full week. But I guess I just want to make sure we're thinking exactly how uh, school lunch is going to be handled um, if it's half the week for some of these kids.
Yes. Um, <laughs> not to that level of detail yet. So okay. it's okay. it's coming. It's it is uh, on our list and in our queue, but uh, there's a couple things ahead of it still. No, I, I get it, and I just I, I just want to make sure that it's it's in our in our sights. Um, and then um, let me see what else. Um, I think I had a question more about some parents seem to be very concerned about um, their kids, some kids missing meetings and then being um, losing out or you know being marked absent or what whatever. Um, they're basically worried about penalization for missing meetings. So I want to make sure I under, uh, understand more on that. Will um, that be the only way that we're doing attendance or um, will there be other ways? That, that is the way we're taking attendance. So if that method, when it's communicated with between parent or teacher to families, if that does not work for some reason, the teacher would need to, the parent would need to reach out to the teacher to understand what I uh, want to be sure um, our parents understand too, is that just especially with our little ones, like the need for that partnership, right? We don't want kids learning simply to be through learning plans and they don't have any time with the live meets with their teachers because that is where the magic happens that is actually where the learning happens um, the good deep learning so we will just need to work with families if it's impossible but we hope that it can be possible yeah i think these parents are more they realize it's that's where the meeting happens. And if they get worried, like, oh my God, I didn't get them on on time and yeah. it's the end of the world. And I think uh, you, you, you made the point there that it's a partnership and they need to talk to the teacher Absolutely. about it. And um, we also wanna, I don't know if this is a good time to throw it in, but we do want to um, make sure that all of our families have adequate devices in the fall. You know, we, we passed out most of the time, single devices to families, maybe two devices if they had multiple children. What we're really looking for, again, as part of that partnership, is that every child in the household has their own device. Mm -hmm. um, and if families cannot provide that device, then we need to know that so we can make sure that every um, every student has that device at home because I know that that was a barrier in the springtime to be able to, if three kids had meets at the same time and one device, this is a problem. So we don't want that to be a barrier for the fall. Yeah, and I understand from later in our, our we, we bought some more devices for that purpose. Yep, that's great. Right, and, and, and we're gonna, we're, we're, we intend to put out there too, because we've had these questions from parents, if they are gonna buy a device, what should they buy? So we're gonna push that information out to parents as well, because, um, you know, it, 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 the, the, we, we have had that, that question, so. And just one, sorry that I've, I've got lots of questions. I think this is the last one. Uh, what about um, the kids are in quarantine? How is instruction going in, in that respect? Um, they can't be at physical school. Is it just going back to normal? Uh, what, what, what they're seeing at the beginning of the year? Yeah, I, I think it is just making that seamless shift instead of um, being in person, we would go back to our live meet schedule. Yeah, okay. Yep. That is it. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, Brian, I have a question. Go ahead, Shelley. Um, going back to the health and safety plan, uh, just one sort of clarifying question um, for Monica. You use the term face coverings. Um, can you just clarify face masks versus face shields and what the recommendation is on that? So the face cover refers to um, a cloth face cover. Um, so the ones that uh, most of us probably in, uh, in this meeting are wearing. The face shield is the one that actually is that plexiglass, clear, transparent shield that goes down in front of the face. Um, and those really are not recommended in lieu of masks. So face cover, sorry, face covers are what is recommended for students. But face shields are... Um, acceptable if a younger child is having a challenging time or perhaps a student in special ed 
um, is having a challenging time wearing a face cover. So that is when um, a facial could be used. So really focusing on that TK through second grade um, and then our special ed population. Thank you. Can we say that to make it um, better for our staff members to be able to work with students with special needs and um, who might not um, be able to either hear very clearly or, or like the, um, seeing their teacher with that face covering, that might be a barrier. And we are looking at different ways that we can add some cloth draping to tuck it into the shirt so it can be a closed unit. So we're working with our nurses on, on and, and some very crafty staff members on how to design maybe a couple of different things like that so that the staff members might have a couple where it can be taken off washed at night and then reapplied maybe through some sort of fabric tape. So we are exploring different options for that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And that would be for teachers too. So teachers doing phonological instruction where they need to see their mouths. Yeah, they can wear that for that, keeping that distance as much as possible. No, I appreciate that because I know that if you wear a face shield in public, you still have to wear a face mask. Correct. So this is good to know about the, the thing you can tuck into your shirt. So that's helpful. Thank you. Vladimir, any questions? No, not right now. Uh, I'm good. See? Okay. Um, I just had a couple before we, we go to public comment. Um, we've heard from some parents who are very concerned about their kids' ability to to learn sort of on the screen or tolerate screen time and these sorts of schedules. So I just want to sort of get a sense of if they do encounter those problems, is it essentially the same process that we've kind of always had for students who have issues in terms of the IEP 504, you know, talk to a teacher and the principal process, or is there a separate accommodation for these kinds of things? It's, it's kind of unprecedented. And can you just sort of give a sense of that? I would say definitely the first step would be for a parent to reach out to their classroom teacher and really have a clear understanding of what that challenge is, um, most definitely. And then uh, if we can't, obviously we would try some type of accommodations and what that might look like. We are hoping, especially for our little learners, that we will have more non-digital pieces for them to engage with. So it's not just about being on the computer. Um, but then as we move along in the process, if we're still not seeing any engagement or there's um, learning issues moving on, then we would bring in the principal and the teams um, to do some troubleshooting and problem solving together. And if I can just add, we'd also be looking kind of into the social emotional pieces as well for that. So we might be um, able to just through, through a, a kind of intervention prior to any type of assessment, really be looking at um, maybe some behavioral support or some emotional support. Um, because again, what we don't know is what a child's um, going through. The reason, what, what, what's the barrier why they can't access it on, on screen, right? If they can access their video games, but they can't access instruction, what, what is that? And so it's very rare that we have students who can really access those video games, but um, have, have a really, you know, no problem that, if they can access video games, they can usually um, access instruction. And if they are not, there's usually a barrier for that. And so I would want to be working with the team members and having our team members, our psychologists, are great resources for that to be able to determine what might be that barrier and what are some ways around those barriers um, before we really look at labeling a child with a disability. Great. Um, I think the other question I had, speaking of sort of evaluation, was that, you know, we sort of know that the spring didn't necessarily go great in all instances. And so um, I also remember from the spring that there was discussion around most of the assessments that we're in the habit of using kind of require an in-person um, session. So my question was both for special ed, but also just for trying to gauge academic progress. What is sort of the plan now that we're gonna come back 100% virtual for some amount of time? How are we gonna sort of figure out where kids are? How are we gonna figure out math placements, those kinds of things? I'll start in Jen Ed, and Jen, you can go to special ed. Uh, so we are looking at some uh, one al 
alternate assessment um, for math placement specifically, just because if you may or may not know, uh, we do love our iReady, but it takes an inordinate, inordinate amount of time for many of our students to get through. Um, we're also looking at kind of a combination of um, being able to train teachers in digitally administering for instance, the Fontas and Pinnell Reading Benchmark Assessment, FNP themselves are developing their materials to be digitized. Um, I think a lot of people in the spring were kind of holding out to hope that perhaps the pandemic would go away. Um, but now that it's everybody's reality, they're, they're updating their materials. So it should be much easier for a teacher to do that. We're also looking to see um, if we can possibly bring some students in on a one-to-one -one basis with the teacher at the beginning of the school year, especially around reading is something that I'm, I'm really most concerned about getting the most accurate assessment data from then. And then we'll be working with teachers. They did a whole module on um, online assessment and feedback and what have you. And that's where that half group and small group using different strategies than what you would typically do in an in-person classroom to get that assessment data. And then for our department, I mean, we stopped in the middle of assessment. So we have a lot of families that, you know, signed assessment plans back in February and that we're still holding. Our challenge is that the, the assessments that we use are, no, are not normed to, to deliver virtually. And so we need to use standardized measures. It takes, you know, seven years to develop a standardized measure. We don't have that much time to figure out what that looks like virtually. So um, our, our best hope is to be able to bring kids in individually in a well ventilated room with, um, some sort of a protective screen so that they can be um, close enough to the assessor um, to be able to get the assessment done as quickly as possible. And um, we are doing a lot of things, everything we can online and anything we can do as a record review, we've already done. The only things that are left over from the spring are things that um, maybe for specific learning disability or, or speech and language, something that has to be done in person where they have to actually see um, what the student is doing either through a you know, visual discrimination test or something. So we um, are waiting for or, or one last piece of kind of protective gear, some plexiglass shields. And as soon as those arrive, we're ready to begin testing um, in a one-to-one -one fashion. So um, we're hopeful that that can happen as, you know, as soon as school starts, we're hoping that they come in. Thank you. Um, okay, at this point, I think we will take public comment on this agenda item. Unless anybody has a pressing question, no. To comment on this agenda item, members of the public should use the raise hand button if using the Zoom app or press star nine if using your phone. Your name will be announced when it is your turn to speak. Prior to providing your comment, please be sure your microphone is on. Do we have anyone who wishes to comment? At least one, all right. Um, I'm just gonna say to note, uh, please note this is an opportunity for members of the public to provide comments to the board. And in the interest of time and fairness, the board and staff cannot engage in dialogue with speakers during the meeting. Um, so if you have more to say, feel that your questions were not answered or would like to have a conversation, we always encourage you to reach out to us via email at trustees at lasdschools.org. Um, we have a couple of trustees, so I think we can go three minutes, Marcy, and you can start. Kyle, I can't see him. I, I can't see the... Okay, there we go. Our first speaker is Amy Madsen. Hi there. Um, I just want to keep bringing up um, a similar point, um, but it seems like a, a key element of success for the virtual learning is, and these were Sandra's words, that the students would build independence over the year. Um, and that it would require partnering with parents. And I did hear you also say you hope it will be possible. So I, I just can't help but continue to think that the district is really inflexible here. I would love to hear if you have some other suggestions. I mean, a few days ago, you had one parent of a, a first grader, Caroline, said that for working parents, it's, it's not going to work. Can you please leave the connection open? Um, and, and you have many reasons why this may not be a good idea, but this is something I've, I've heard a lot. You know, in the spring, I know top-notch kids, meaning, sorry, super uh, sharp students. I've helped out in classrooms, kindergarten, first grade, second, third, and I've seen them, them miss meetings. And 
earlier on last spring, you talk about, you know, cultivating the executive function of kids, but I, I think that's almost a farcical term to use for kindergartners, first graders, second graders, third graders, and, and even some of the older kids are not, may not be super independent. So I'm just wondering, I just can't help but say that I, I don't think you're being um, flexible to, to really think of a variety of different solutions to address this point. So I, I do want to keep bringing it up. Um, practically speaking, um, fourth graders won't be in school until six weeks into the school year in the, in the best of circumstances if we get off the monitoring list. Um, and this could, I, I don't know if Santa Clara County has some forecasts on, on when um, we'll be off the um, monitoring lists based on um, certain health, health trends. Um, but I, I just, is the, is the writing on the wall? I mean, are we going to be home for many, many, many months, if not the whole school year? So does it, does it make sense to continue to differentiate between a hybrid model and a 100% virtual one? And I'd also like to know, like, how many kids would be, you know, in the virtual classes, so to speak, those who are 100% at home learning? You know, will there be disparity between those kids and the ones who do select the hybrid? You know, might those be a class of 10, you know, versus a class of 20, and they could have more teacher time. So those are some thoughts um, that continue, you know, to be on my mind. And I think we just keep getting excuses as to or reasoning why you've moved ahead with your plan. I, I don't think you've genuinely, you know, listened to the feedback and, and, and pivoted. So I, I really, I would like to challenge you to be flexible in thinking, you know, or at least share with us, you know, what are some of the alternatives to help you know, working parents and, and parents who, who really aren't able to or, 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 or don't want to spend all day with their kids. I, I do think it, it, it borders on, on a derelict of, of duty in, in, in educating. Thank you, Amy. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Jason Leonard. Oh, hi. Um, I, I just quickly kind of echo uh, some of what Amy was saying um, as far as responsiveness. I, I think there were some really heartbreaking, you know, comments last week um, on, on the call, and I didn't really hear many of those uh, addressed at all tonight. Um, what I wanted to talk about, um, so I have a seventh grader, um, so that's really where my interest lies. Um, I was pretty disappointed in the, the phasing slide. Um, so he would be, if, if I recall, in the seventh phase um, with a at least two to three week uh, cadence between phases. I, I think that means best case December, January before he gets on, uh, on campus, uh, probably worse than that. Um, I, I do, understand the the kind of uh you know phased introduction of students um uh, in the elementary uh campuses you're you're just trying to you know limit the, the number of people who are just physically there and avoiding uh issues that drop off and and uh, and pick up i i don't understand why seventh and eighth graders would wait through all of those phases for the the elementary schools to gradually build up they're on a different campus um uh, and why seventh and eighth would would go together? Um, that's yeah. That that just seems not terribly logical and, and not really uh, kind of maximizing the the time that the uh, junior high kids could have on campus. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Seeing no further hands, I'm going to close public comments and return to board discussion. Anyone have further, Steve? Yeah, actually, the last speaker actually brought up one of my questions was around the phasing slide and the, the concept of, it seemed that in, in conversations we've been having in discussing options, one of the idea was, yes, we'd go to the AB cohort, but then hopefully we'd be able to go to be able to go to an a four day on one day off for everyone approach was what I remembered in the conversation. Is that still something we're considering for further out, assuming fingers crossed everything goes well? Um, or are we strictly going to go to always stick to the, the AB cohort? So 
So that is uh, certainly a, a uh, point of discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's strong. Uh, it's all I can say is it hinges on whether or not we can effectively um, adhere to all of the health guidelines that will be in place. And I think that is the, that's the unknown right now, Steve. Understood that. And, and um, along the lines of, of, we did look at it by grade level, but the idea of looking at it by campus level, if there's, I know there's conversations going on about how, how to address that um, junior high co component, but the phasing of that in maybe a little bit earlier, uh, given that it is a separate campus and it is a different model is something I think you guys are looking at, but it, again, it hasn't been worked out, so we haven't discussed it, is that correct? That's, that's right. The other piece that's gonna be critical in my mind, and I think I'm hoping somebody can help clarify this for me. We talk about cohorts on campus. We're very careful to define what a cohort is, what that looks like. Uh, we've talked about um, what we're gonna to do to try to maintain that. I think one of the things that's gonna be critical that we don't have sight over or oversight over, and it's gonna require a parent engagement and agreement to do is stable cohorts outside of the school. And what does that look like? And this idea that um, this falls apart if we suddenly open up the door and you go home, but you don't go home to a, a group that, that they have already been exposed to if they go home to a different group or they go to an after school sporting team that brings in kids from other schools. Uh, do we have a, a point of view on any of that that we're going to be communicating to families? Because I do think that's the one area where this could go off the rails pretty quickly. So I don't, so I don't know the, the county guidance on that, mm -hmm. whether their expectation is that the, the children belong to no other cohorts other than their school cohorts. Right. Um, that, that I still have not seen yet, Steve. I understand your point. And are, are we looking to, for them to define that or are we asking them to define that? Or are we just gonna wait till they get around to it? Because I know the high schools have all canceled fall sports. They're saying, we're not gonna do that. We know that this is at a risk and they push that all out to the spring. Um, I would hope that we could be look, at least looking, at least encouraging families not to sign their kid up for after school sports if that's going to introduce a different cohort mix and that kind of thing. Can I add to that? Just with the, um, the one thing also with after school sports and after school activities, I think we, we may have to consider families' needs and what they are for, for child care and for activities. So, it really, um, it really is gonna be a partnership with families and families to really identify who are their stable cohorts outside of school. And it comes back to that you know, public health principle of being able to contact trace. So if there is an exposure outside of school in a different cohort, that family is able to identify who those individuals are that need to be notified so that they can be isolated and we can um, you know, contact people quickly and stop you know, stop the spread, so to speak. Um, so just really, um, I don't know if we'll be able to, to sort of say, you know, please don't do that, but just telling families to please be mindful, be aware of who you're interacting with in the event of an outbreak. Or are we asking, is this reporting that you're, you're putting in place, is any, are we gonna be asking, are you registered for any ex external events? Or are we gonna be asking that up front, or are we just gonna wait for something to go wrong and report it back? So uh, can you ask that question a different way, Steve? Sure. So it, if I know that my child's gonna be, in, the only way this is gonna work is my child has to go to daycare, which I get, I have no other option, or I, my child needs to be in a sports activity that will involve other kids from other schools. Can we, are we asking parents to let us know about that at least in advance? We'll know in advance what, what the exposure might be, at least on, in our records somewhere, or are we just gonna wait for, oh, Someone in a school in Cupertino has now been quarantined for these reasons. My child played soccer with that child, uh, is on a soccer team with that child. Are we just gonna wait for that sort of ran, that trickle down reporting to get to us? So it seems to me that we can make parents aware of the health orders. Uh -huh. 
but I don't know that we can track every outside activity that our families participate in. Is that what you're suggesting? I'm asking if it's, if it, if we're asking them to, to do a daily monitoring of the child's health, which makes perfect sense. And I do have a question about that next, but that somehow um, at least defining what their child's <coughs> routine is could be helpful for us tracking a little more proactively than waiting for it to not be in a good place. And that's all I'm asking that if, if my child's in also in a theater camp somewhere or whatever they're doing elsewhere, um, just a list of that to go along with that child so we know in advance might be something to consider. And that's all I'm asking you to do is consider that. I understand it, it's, it would be, could be a heavy lift, but it would be, I think at some point helpful. Um, right. And I, and I think this ties into that, that idea of um, parents have talking, been talking about potting uh, their students as well, right? Trying to, to attend to this. So yeah, I think that's something we can consider and look into. Um, Monica, if you can make a note of that. And then on the symptom tracing bit, I get that I think that, that, that it's great that we're putting together the app. I do have concerns about families that may not own thermometers, like they didn't have computers, or they might not have um, ability to have a, a device with a, that could work an app. Do, have another, do they have another way to report symptoms on a daily basis? And I just assume that report is now read by the school and the school protocol to deal with uh, of tracking those reports. But um, are we going to provide, we might need to be thinking we may need to provide some other um, support materials for families that don't have the necessary things we need. Just something I want to throw out there is we're buying hotspots and computers. Do we need to be looking at thermometers and some other things? Okay. And the last one, I think. Um, as you're, as Andrew was talking about schools and, and, and children sharing work and especially the younger grades, you actually made that the gesture of holding something up in, in front of a camera, which is what I would do to talk about that. Um, school supplies to the home, whereas normally we have school supplies in the classroom for kids to use. Um, are we, are we going to have a, a way to put that? And I think this falls into Jessica's hot lunch or lunch discussion. It's something we know we have to deal with that we haven't thought about yet, would be my assumption. But I just wanted to add that to the list of things to think about. Uh, absolutely. And we've done some thinking about it as well. Um, so I think that will be communicated fairly soon. It may have been already in the spring by grade level, but I know we're planning on doing it again shortly and including not only kind of your typical school supplies, but perhaps some art supplies so students can engage in art docent lessons, maybe even like a ball or a jump rope or some very simple um, physical education supplies. And we know we have to purchase some for families who um, will be unable to purchase those supplies themselves. Great. Thank you. Yep. That's everything. All my questions. <laughs> okay. Um, Shali? Anything? No? Vladimir? Uh, no, I'm good. I, I have a couple of questions, but I, I, can, I can go over them with Jeff. Okay. Um, I have a couple of things I wanted to touch on. Um, I I do hear the the concern about. Um, so I I agree with the junior highs that it may make more sense to look at reopening those as the speaker said without waiting for the elementary schools to fill up. I, you know, I do think that maybe there it's a more gradual phasing, um, sort of bringing kids back, you know, sort of one day at a time, depending on what, what makes sense. I do think realistically, given the county's current guidance, it probably will be December before junior highs are back on campus at any, for any length of time, if I was going to place a bet. So unfortunately, I think we've got to wrap our heads around that, but see what we can do in the meantime to as you know, build community and, and get kids interaction. And, and I think pods are going to be a reality for a lot of, a lot of families to try to, to try to do those things. And that's just some, something we're going to have to deal with. Um, I think one of the things that we get from the, from both the emails that we received and, and the speakers tonight is that, 
you know, unfortunately, this is going to be a bit of a, of a fractal situation where you're going to have a lot of different kids struggling with a lot of different things. Um, and so I, I don't expect that, that you have an answer, but one of the questions I want to ask for sort of things that we can work on and maybe um, ways that we can sort of channel our parent volunteer energy since they won't be allowed on campus is how do we provide that student support um, and responsiveness, right? When the kids aren't aren't doing synchronous learning, I totally get that a lot of them feel very disconnected if there's just kind of nothing going on. So is there a way to, you know, supervise chat rooms so that they can kind of hang out with each other while they're doing their work or have an adult ask questions of on a Wednesday so that they're not blocked for half the day. And so I don't know if you have any concrete thoughts about that, but I know that's definitely something that our community would be interested in hearing answers to and, and probably even help with if we can direct them. Yeah, I would say at this point, I don't know that we have concrete answers, but similar to a couple of the things that you've listed, right? We've talked about with principals partnering with our PTA site folks about how can we help organize some of this so that there are no kids left behind in that system also. Um, yeah, so nothing concrete, but yes, we know it's on the list. Um, and sort of along those same lines of, of sort of parents figuring out, I think there's also, there's a lot of concern, you know, as we've seen when things are, um, are sort of undefined, right? And I know parents are extremely concerned about childcare and, and schedules and everything else. The survey of sort of who is initially opting out knows that they want to opt out in the long term of in-person education closed on Friday. Do you have any sense of what the timeline is going forward about how, you know, you, I know you have to do a tremendous amount of work to sort of figure out how the pieces fit together and then we have to create cohorts. We have a sense of timeline about when parents can expect to sort of hear about that and then, you know, and what the process will be after that if they feel like they need adjustments or they're trying to align their pod, you know, off day pods with, with their classes and that kind of thing. You want me to go for that one, Jeff? <laughs> sure, go ahead. You can start right. and then I'll. Uh, so we are, uh, you know, this weekend after the survey closed on Friday, we spent much of the weekend reaching out to families who had not yet responded or had a, a mixed response perhaps for their two or three or more children that they wanted different programs for them or different approaches for them. Uh, we're working with principals tomorrow to start discussing sections and staffing. Uh, there is a lot that absolutely goes into it. Um, typically our families get to know their class placement like the Friday before school starts. We certainly want to do it before then. Um, early August, second week of August, first week if we could make it happen, but that's next week. So I don't know that that's likely, um, but we, we know that the um, families need that information to kind of begin organizing their lives. So we're working as quickly as we can to try to um, move quickly through the process, even though it is laborious for sure. And it's best for for parents who have you know day of the week can, in the in the out you know in the in the slightly longer term once we can get people back should they wait to see should they communicate those through some channel beforehand do you have any preference there we have a preference there Jeff so no I th I think we're going to I think we're going to schedule the kids the children the students and then. The, the parent the principals at the school level we've already talked about this are going to are going to take the the um, you know the feedback or the adjustments or their requests right because we want to initially schedule them so that kids are on the same day whether they're in kindergarten or seventh grade right? That's the default assumption that we have heard as an overwhelming request from our families with a couple of exceptions. Um, but then if it's something other than that, we're going to, um, as I said, allow principal at the, principals at the school level to make those adjustments. That, that's where the relationships are. So that's where it makes most sense to, to accomplish that. Okay. 
I know you guys are juggling a tremendous number of factors behind the scene. So I think um, hopefully a lot of a lot of the questions that we've been getting about why not this, why not that will become a little clearer once people see exactly how how many things need to fit together. Because um, I know it feels like from this side it should go without saying, but I think it probably doesn't, Sandra, that you and your team have been have worked through a tremendous number of permutations over the summer to try to figure out how this will actually work. I'm a little surprised that you came up with an answer that hopefully will work because it, it certainly seemed insoluble to me. So, so I appreciate all the work that's, that's gone into it. But I do think it is worth everybody keeping in mind that this is gonna be a process, right? Even though we, we took an emergency stab at this in the spring, this is still something that nobody's ever really tried before. And so certainly my expectation is that we're gonna iterate, right? Like hopefully what we come up with will work as well as it can for as many kids as it can off the top. But I think everybody needs to, to understand that, you know, it won't work perfectly for all kids day one. And so I know right. your team will do everything they can to, to fix issues and make adjustments as fast as we can. But, and, and um, I think Brian, I, I think it's important to recognize too, that it is going to be less than optimal, right? What, whatever plan we come up with to, uh, uh, to ensure children are educated through this pandemic, it will not be as good as having every child on campus in front of a teacher, right? That's, I think we just have to come to terms with that at a certain level too, right? We are working um, as hard as we can to come up with the very best situation possible, but there's no way it can be as good as kids in front of a teacher five days a week, uh, eight to three. Right, eight thirty to three. Sure, absolutely. I just, you know, I, I hope that you, that you guys and I know you will, but I just want to say this. You know, we've got a tremendous amount of energy and expertise and everything else in our community. So, even though we can't make it work as well as we would like, you know, using just LASD staff, right? We've got, as we say every year, we get, I don't know what the number is, hundreds of thousands of volunteer hours from our community, and I think we're going to need to redirect a lot of that to trying to make the educational standpoint um, as, as good as we can, right? And I know you didn't Absolutely. mean it this way, Jeff, but I know that, you know, just because we know it's not gonna be optimal doesn't mean that we're gonna be satisfied with, we're gonna throw up our hands and say, well, it's not optimal, what do you want, right? We're gonna- Nope, that's not what I said, problem. correct. I know, <laughs> I, know this, I knew at least it wasn't what you meant. Um, so, um, so anyway, I think overall, um, I don't think I have any other comments. Um, I think we're generally all in favor of pushing forward with the waiver process as much as we can um, in the way that you laid out. I think um, in terms of taking a few of these other things last, in terms of phased approach, we made comments about maybe rethinking the junior high side of that. Um, and um, I know there's been some discussion too about um, seeing in accordance with the, in compliance with the county guidelines, um, there's been discussion kind of at the site level of whether the teachers can at least sort of get a few kids at a time to just sort of say hi from 10 feet away in the run up to school. Cause we know that those relationships sometimes need just being in this, you know, physically close to somebody for at least 30 seconds to, to make the connection. Um, so I imagine that's part of the waiver process as well. Um, and then in terms of the metrics slide, I don't think I had any particular comments on this. I think it made sense. Um, before we look for approval, any other board members have comments on either the phased approach or the metrics or anything else that's come up in discussion? No, I think that Jeff, what you and your team have come up with is very solid. And I think we need to appreciate that this is a constantly moving target. And I really appreciate that you have thought about every contingency. What happens if the county opens up tomorrow? What happens if it shuts down in two days? Like we have to be really nimble. and We have to think about what's in the best interest of all of our kids and all of their myriad home situations. And so, I don't know, I think it's, I think it's very solid. And I think that, um, you know, as this goes on, as the school year goes on and we see more and more of 
what's happening, which way the county is going, which way the state is going, you know, we will have to pivot if we need to. And I feel like what you have laid out for us tonight is well poised to pivot if we need to. So thank you for that. Brian, can I just add uh, one thing? Marcy, if we go back two slides. So I, I think the, and I, I think I'll, I think the board knows this, but just making sure it's clear. Um, as and I, I appreciate Mr. Um, Leonard's comments um, with regard to the junior high school and and noted um, the the just remembering that with the junior high school we're not going to be able to come back in any fashion in person until the county clears that that monitoring list right and um brian you you alluded to it but it 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 appears that that's going to be a challenge for some time um for the county to clear that monitoring list but that that's really what we're looking for um with regard to our junior high school uh some of this uh the, the other grades except for grades seven and eight could potentially get phased back in in a, in a, a sequence safe manner under a waiver process, right? And I think if we demonstrate we can do that safely, that could happen under the waiver process, right? Timing, of course, will be a part of the discussion and, and um, time between phases and so forth. Uh, right, that that's that that will be um, part of what's discussed with the the county health department, but um, just making sure that there is that understanding that junior high school does not get to return in person until until Santa Clara County clears that monitoring list for fourteen straight days. Yeah, I mean, I think. I, I didn't say explicitly before, but I do think that, I don't know if it has to be a full two weeks, but you, we definitely need some, I think, unfortunately, what we've seen from reopenings around the country is that if you don't really space out the steps, then you think you're doing okay until all of a sudden it catches up with you. And so, you know, as painful as it is to look at this phase and sort of do the math about how long that is, I'm not sure I see an alternative. I mean, we've seen a couple of businesses in downtown Los Altos just in the last couple of weeks have shut down for cases. You know, it's unfortunately all the metrics are going the wrong way. So we've got to be as careful as we as we can, probably more careful and more patient than than we would like to be. Anyone else? Jessica Vladimir, any other thoughts? No, I'm good. Okay. All right, then I think the last thing uh, that we need before we leave this item is formal approval of the health and safety provisions of the reopening plan. So I am prepared to entertain a motion. Uh, I'd like to move that we approve uh, the health and uh, reopening plan as presented. A second. Okay, motion by Vladimir, second by Shali to approve the health and safety portion of the draft 2020-2021 reopening plan. Uh, I will call the roll. Shali? Yes. Vladimir? Uh, if you can hear me, yes. <laughs> gotcha. Steve? Yes. Jessica? Yes. I vote yes. Motion passes 5 nothing. Thank you, everyone. So we'll move on to F2 financial update. Mr. Kenyon will provide a financial update. Thanks, Brian. Waiting for the slides to show. Thank you, Marcy. So let's go to the first slide after the title slide. <clears throat> so quick update on where we stand regarding property taxes. Um, our assessed value roll is closed as of July 1. It's actually up 7.31% over the roll for the for the prior year, right? Um, you'll recall that we're budgeting 5% tax increases. And at this point, we wanna stay with that estimate until we know more about 
what the collections might be and whether there's going to be significant role corrections during the year or not. But this was good news. Um, significant increase in the tax roll. Uh, we'll get we'll have more information in August on that and again during the year. Um, so I'll we'll update you again in August. The next slide will be about uh, state funding. So uh, the tax receipts are coming in, the state revenue and tax receipts are coming in above the forecasted level right now. Waiting on the July receipts for personal income tax, that's a real key driver of state revenues. And we're almost through July, so we will get that information pretty soon. Um, and we'll see what the state has to do with that. Um, we were expecting, we all heard that the state was gonna adopt a budget and then make changes probably in August and September. Now the talk is that they might not make any changes after all. Um, and their focus seems to be more on districts making adjustments at first interim, depending on what's happening both statewide and locally. So I expect that we will continue to update you as we have information and we'll make our decisions, but um, we're not gonna be making, uh, there may not be any state revisions as was originally thought. So that's what I know about local taxes and state funding. Um, so I'm gonna move to some of our funding sources to in response to the pandemic. So next slide and the one after that. <clears throat> so we have a number of funding sources just to keep you up updated on what, what we're looking at. Um, so I've got a slide on each one of those. So we have a, almost $72,000 committed from the state under Senate Bill 117 has fairly broad spectrum of allowable uses. And um, we have at this point an indefinite period of time with which to spend those funds and get reimbursed. Um, we've obviously spent some of those funds already. Um, those are coming without any strings attached, well, other than the allowable uses that's essentially grant money to us. We don't need to do anything in terms of an application. So the next one. So as part of the Federal CARES Act, there is what's called ESSER money, elementary and secondary school emergency relief money. Again, this is kind of like Senate Bill 117. It's kind of a grant of money to us. We don't need to apply for it, just under $80,000. Um, very broad discretion as to how the money can be used and a fairly lengthy timeline within which to spend those funds. Next slide. The more recent one is a part of the adopted state budget, the learning loss mitigation funding. Um, this comes primarily from federal money from the CARES Act, but there's a small portion of state funding that's a piece of this as well. Uh, earlier, I gave you an estimate of about $1.8 million from, for us from this. That was the preliminary estimate from Sacramento. Uh, they've now updated that estimate down for us to about $1.65 million. Um, there are specific allowable uses. We covered those at the last board meeting uh, when I addressed this. They're listed here again on this slide. And this is a much more tight timeline we have until the end of this calendar year um, to use, use the funds. So continuing on this, let's go to the next slide. Um, there is a requirement, I mentioned this at the last board meeting for an LCAP. This LCAP is the Learning Continuity and Attendance Plan um, that needs to be adopted by September 30th. And in that plan, we will have to identify exactly how we expect to spend the money on the various uh, allowable uses. So we're in the process of beginning to develop that plan and develop all the expenditure, uh, our expenditure plan as well. Um, uh, but listed below on this slide are some of the things that we've already identified, um, buying additional Chromebooks and hotspots. And you see for some of the materials, we've put some estimated um, costs for instructional materials, uh, for curriculum resources, for some professional development. And we also expect to spend on our um, school meals. 
going to the next slide. Lastly, I've included the uh, FEMA money, um, which would be after the fact funding available. There's a rather rigorous um, process involved in getting FEMA funds. Uh, I was on a webinar with some consultants who uh, this consulting group is out of New York and Washington DC and they are former FEMA employees primarily uh, now working in a consulting firm um, explaining how the process can work. Uh, we have contacts here in in the state of California who um, public agency contacts who indicate that it is a very laborious process and um, you need to have help to get through it. Um, and it'll be a while we, we're in it, we put in an application, so we're in a queue, so, so funding be available for us. Um, and we will consider pursuing that depending on the circumstances and whether we have a need to or not. Next slide, Marcy. Oh, this is the final one. So we do have a small amount of money that's coming from the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, just a little under twelve thousand um, dollars. There was a number of allowable uses that the foundation uh, promoted in their in their grant offerings. Uh, we had to specify in our application what we wanted to spend the money on. We chose to spend our twelve thousand dollars, a little under twelve thousand dollars, on uh, reimbursing us for the cost of meals for needy families. There's a five month window within which to spend that money ending on September 30th. Now the next slide. So what, uh, what are some of the commitments we've already made or plan to make? Um, I've talked in our uh, health and safety section of our presentation earlier about the purchase of equipment and supplies. So indicating here some of the equipment that's already been purchased and the amounts. Um, again, Again, these would cover us for several months during the year. I think in most cases through December, half of the year. Um, Monica's mentioned the additional outdoor wash stations, the mobile hand, hand sanitizer stations. I mentioned the signage that we're buying. So to date, we've spent about $50,000 on this equipment um, and supplies. Uh, some of this was donated from the state. Um, us, not a... Not, a significant amount, but less than half of this was donated by the state and the rest we've purchased. Going to the next slide for additional expenditures. So we have spent around $70,000 through June only um, in buying the meals for the needy students, uh, including during the summer um, in contract with the Mountain View Wisman School District. We've spent approximately $50,000 on additional custodial staff, either subs when we had custodians, either who were uh, high risk, we have some elder, some custodians in the high risk category, um, or additional staff, substitute additional custodial staff to deal with some of the cleaning that we've had to do. Um, cleaning supplies, we've spent about $25,000 to date. I expect we'll be spending more as we go through the year. And then on technology, um, we'll be ordering a little under 300 additional Chromebooks. Uh, Sandra talked about the need to have individual um, Chromebooks for individual students, not one per family, but one per student. Um, we're also looking at updating our infrastructure. This was part of our planned um, spending in our in our IT department this year. It's, it was included in our adopted budget, so it's not something that we necessarily um, weren't expecting to do. Um, certainly we could get uh, some relief from some of the perhaps the learning loss mitigation funding on that expenditure. Uh, and we have a need to get updated laptops for a number of folks, particularly special ed staff and some of the district office staff um, to be more effective in how we're operating. So there's an estimated cost there and I'm not sure if that's the last slide, Marcy, or not. Um, additionally, at the end of the of these slides, I included the presentation I gave you at the last board meeting, just in case there was a need to refer back to that. So that's included as an appendix. So that's the update I have, um, sharing some information about our funding sources, what we're spending money on, as well as where our, uh, what it looks like at the local and 
state level in terms of funding information. So I'll turn it back to you, Brian. All right, thank you, Randy. Um, board questions? I have a quick question. Uh, were uh, we as a public school district entitled to a PPP loan? So, um, no, as a, we're not a nonprofit or a private institution. So as a public agency, we were not eligible for such a loan. Okay. Yeah, I, went, I did some math and basically all addition of all the things that we, we got um, so far, we got over about or will be getting or entitled to is about uh, 2 million. Uh, my understanding is that, and we have about, about 4,000 students, maybe a little under, plus 500 to 500, 600 staff, um, where we received about 2 million. Um, I understand the charter school actually got uh, $2 million, but they have maybe 1,000 to 1,100 uh, students. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know how much staff, I, I know our numbers better. Um, Thank you so much for going after that money. I wish we, we got commensurate to what they, they did. Um, I don't like the inequity um, in this situation. It's, it's more of a statement than a question, but thank you. Other board questions? I just had a quick, Randy, it's not um, for the CARES money, um, the numbers that you have in here are, are pretty small relative to the overall. So it's, and it's not obvious to me from the categories that are eligible, whether it's a matter of simply sort of figuring out where we're spending money that we can then essentially allocate the carriers money to, or whether we should be, whether we or Jeff or Sandra and the team need to be looking at adding programs basically to utilize that money. So can you comment there? Well, I think that's what we're trying to work on right now, Brian, is the plan on how much okay. is added um, programs or services or whatever to make sure that we're, you know, dealing with the learning loss issue. That's what the money is for. Um, right. So we're not, we're not quite there yet to present that. We have, have we gotten a sense from the state I don't know if it's the auditor, I've heard that term thrown around about how they're going to analyze our use of that money. Like, are there, are there clear guidelines about what will count and will not count as far as, you know, what counts as learning loss mitigation? I mean, because it says there's a lot of use of, of the word additional and extra in here. And so I don't know what they're using for a baseline and, and how hard they're going to clamp down on that. Yeah, I'm beginning to get, you know, there, there will be very specific guidelines and, and probably restrictions. Um, I don't have a great deal of information yet on that. We're hearing that that's forthcoming from CDE. So stay tuned. Again, that will be, that will help drive our plan to some extent, I would think. Okay. I mean, I understand it's a sort of a tricky accounting and balancing act, but I mean, given sort of the the encouraging news earlier in the presentation, I would rather see us add programs to mitigate learning loss, you know, and then end up spending more than this CARES money than have some of the CARES money go by the boards. Absolutely. So, okay. Great. You don't want any of that money not to go to LASD. Yeah, right. Okay, um, we will take public comment. Uh, on this agenda item, to comment on this agenda item, members of the public should use the raise hand button if using the Zoom app or press star nine if using your phone. Do we have anyone who wishes to comment? Randy's continuing his unbroken streak of having very few public commenters. Uh, seeing no hands, I will close public comment. We open it for any further board discussion. Vladimir. Yeah, I'd like to uh, offer that for under the learning loss, I, I also thought that the amount of money that we would be getting, <clears throat> it would seem hard to spend it all. So I'd like to offer that we could um, take a look at uh, some mental health related services, uh, screenings, intensive services, 
things like that uh, to augment uh, what we already do. Um, we could also look at sort of uh, some daycare um, uh, activities that we could augment, uh, especially for uh, populations that are underserved so far. And then finally, uh, I know Jennifer would love this, uh, to use some of that money for uh, special uh, children with special needs. So I'd just like to make sure that we consider um, using some of that CARES money for um, these kinds of activities that haven't been explicitly mentioned. Thank you. Again, we have to be careful that we follow the guidelines and restrictions, but we will, we will take into account all those suggestions. Oh, of course, of course. Um, so are we going to see, I guess our next meeting is August 10th. Do you think we'll have clarity by then around how this money will be spent? I don't think, I think that's too early. That's we, too early. We, our team is not ready to get that far in depth, Brian. By that sure. That's a, okay. I mean, I, you know, if we do need to, to stand up new things, August 10th is the last meeting we have before the beginning of the year. So, but I know that there is a million things to do. So it is what it is a little bit, but, but December 30th is coming fast as well. All right, uh, without any other comment, I think we are, we'll close this item unless you need any further direction, Randy. No, this was just an update. I need no direction. Well, we gave you some anyway, but. Uh, Appreciate that. <laughs> all right, moving on to F3 board policy update, BP 470 COVID-19 mitigation plan. Mr. Bear. Yes, uh, this is a, um, a board policy, as you said, 0470, um, dealing specifically with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and addresses a number of areas that give specific policy guidance uh, during the course of this pandemic. Um, it, in some cases, does uh, bolster or uh, supersede existing policy uh, in light of the fact that we do have a, a, a pretty special set of circumstances uh, going on right now. Uh, the thought would be that at the, uh, whatever the board deems the conclusion of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, that this policy would uh, be suspended at that time. Um, covers a number of areas. I know you all have uh, looked through it, but from health and safety uh, to staffing, to food, to uh, discrimination, um, covers a range of um, existing policies and would be in place, um, put in place immediately upon adoption, uh, again, until, until the board um, suspends it. So with that, I'm happy to take comment. Uh, it is here for, is it here for read, Brian, or is it here as action? I think it's here as yeah, it's a, a discussion, the discussion is, item today, yeah. Yeah, discussion item tonight, the thought is we'll bring it back um, at our next meeting with any requested changes um, formally adopted at our first regular meeting of the next school year. Any, so board uh, comments or questions or, actually, let me go, since it was brief, let me uh, go to public comment first, uh, just see if anybody has any thoughts. Um, is there anyone who wishes to comment on this agenda item? Seeing none, we'll go back to board discussion. All right, since nobody's champing at the bit, I will have, I've got a couple of comments um, myself. Um, there's a couple of nits um, in the, the section on potential reclosure, which I think is the last section of the document. Um, there's a bit about um, if there's a, a case, then the building shall be closed for disinfection. Um, and it wasn't clear to me from the guidance we have whether the building level is the right level there, whether it should be the classroom, given the design of our campuses. Um, 
the second paragraph under potential reclosure of campus. So that's just a question about whether the policy be, should be to close the entire building or just the, the classrooms involved. Um, I also had a question, and this may be too small in it, but in the non-discrimination section, it's not entirely clear to me how we walk the, the line between non-disclosure of health information and yet contact tracing um, and sort of telling people, you know, why they're quarantining at home. So I don't know if, if I really even sort of need an answer, but it, it sort of wasn't clear to me. I don't know how, how concrete the guidance from the county has been about how we, how do you navigate that. You're muted, Jeff. Twelve hours later, Sandra, um, from my first muted reminder to now. Um, so my understanding is that we would get uh, Santa Clara County Public Health involved um, upon identification or a positive test um, being reported, and um, they would do the. They they have the documents for us to do the noticing. It doesn't say who the person is, but just that there has been a a positive te uh, um, test within, you know, a particular class. So therefore quarantining will be, you know, in effect for X amount of time. Um, but in terms of who does the tracing, um, that, that will be out of our hands. So I really don't think I could tell you whether, you know, the, the, the contact tracers identify who the positive test is or not. Um, I don't have an understanding of how that works since we won't be doing it. Okay, that's fine. Is it something you want an answer for and we can- No, not, not particularly. It's just okay. A, a question. I mean, I sort of understand that at the end of the day, all of these things are gonna have to yield to the reality of, of, of the situation. Um, the, only, the only, I think, sort of substantive change that I kind of would like to see if, if the rest of the board is amenable is something in kind of the first paragraph, I think, in the preamble, just making it clear that, that you as the superintendent have authority to make changes to sort of the board approved. So we're approving our, the reopening plan, right? And I, I think if, if we're doing this COVID mitigation plan, it should be clear that you have the authority to make changes as circumstances or health orders warrant, just with the expectation that you'll bring any changes to board approved plans to the board at the next meeting um, in lieu of having to wait for approval. Um, so just, I think, spelling that out, which I think is sort of the same thing that we said in our emergency meeting all the way back at the beginning of this process. So I just wanna see that encapsulated in this as well. Yep. And I know Steve's brought that up previously as well. So I think I saw a quorum of nodding heads at that comment. Shelley? The godlike power. I actually <laughs> have a question about um, the section and follow up with infected person slash contact tracing. Um, just sort of a clarification question. Are we done with your question, Brian? I wasn't sure. Yes, I'm done. <laughs> okay. So, um, I guess the last sentence on that paragraph, while maintaining the privacy of the infected person, the district shall inform other students and staff with whom the infected person may have had contact in school. I just want to be clear, like who's, so for example, whose responsibility it is to tell people. So for example, if a child tests positive, wherever they got tested, we would notify everybody in the class that someone in your class has tested positive and now you need to quarantine but we will not release the name of that child. And if that child is someone who perhaps is, had a, I guess play dates, we don't do that anymore, but some sort of contact with someone else in that class, it's the responsibility of the contact tracers to contact those families and say, hey, your child was in contact with so-and-so who was, who was tested positive. It's not, it's, it's, I'm assuming it's not our responsibility. Um, you're on mute, Jeff. My understanding is, thank you. My understanding is it is our responsibility to the level of um, notifying a class of exposure. Right. 
right? But not to the level of actual contact tracing. That's, that's, the, that's as deep as our uh, contact tracing goes, and it's not really contact tracing. It's just a notification of a, of a cohort that there's been exposure and there will be a requirement to quarantine. So I think that's maybe something that's important um, for parents to know when the school year starts, um, because I have seen some comments, emails, et cetera, where that's not really clear to them, where they would think that we would have to tell them the name of the child, their child was in contact. Mm. So that okay. I, and there are, just for any trustees who aren't aware of the, County has been talking um, in some of the calls that they've been holding. That they're actually going to train a, I believe, correct, Jeff, correct me if this is not, not the case, but my understanding is they're going to train a cohort of basically school specific contract tracers who are, you know, have the specific training for dealing with when you have students and minors and all the rest of that, all the issues that come along with that as opposed to adults. Yep, that is correct. That's my understanding as well. So essentially, the, the mechanism is going to be the same mechanism that we use when there's head lice in the class, right? Um, you send out a letter saying your child has been exposed to head lice. Yes. So, yeah. The, yes. So in that sense, yes. That's the, that's the level of our notification. Okay. Any other, oh, Steve? And the only other comment that I, I, I want to throw out there is I understand this is COVID specific. Um, I think some of the language and the learnings we've had since we passed the pandemic um, uh, board policy that we put in place, um, this, this, has been, this is much more detailed, I think better informed. And so when we're all done with this, just making sure that we don't throw this work away, make sure that we re review the two and possibly merge them. It's the only thing I ask of you. So. Okay, so just, um, I was thinking about that. Um, so the document we passed previously was a, a pandemic plan, which was a part of our uh, school site safety plans, right? Mm -hmm. Which I, I will take a look at them, Steve. Um, this one has more to do with board policy. That one has, though they do, they do mirror each other in some ways. I, I see what you're saying. I think that they do mirror each other a lot from what I read, to be honest yeah. with you. I just think that we, this one seems more informed because we're more down that path than what we passed. So I'm just asking us to not lose the work because as you said, we, once we say this is done, this is no longer board policy. I'd like us not to lose the work you guys have done. I'd like us just to update what we've already done because I think it, and you think it could stand a revision based on what we've learned. Yep, makes sense. I don't think we'll forget it for a long time either. All right, anything else? Not seeing any. Jeff, I assume you have everything you need. I do. All right, then I believe we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Bye. I know, so ending of special meetings is so abrupt. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all.